think we're good to go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Botezatu. I'm Assistant Professor and Enology Extension Specialist here with uh, um, AgriLife Extension Services at Texas A&M. And um, following feedback from previous webinars, feedback that you sent to me, um, I um, decided on organizing a talk today, a webinar, um, about the Pierce's disease um, resistant varietals and options for management of Pierce's disease. Um, the presenter today is Professor Jim Kamas. He is also with AgriLife Extension Services, and he will be the one talking um, to you today about um, these varietals. So, Jim, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. And um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Andrea. I, I appreciate everyone's interest. This is something that has really uh, taken up a whole lot of my career, just the whole uh, notion of, of Pierce disease and, and how to manage it both short term and long term. And before we really get to the, the whole idea of, of uh, more information about the varieties, I want to kind of roll back the time clock the clock a little bit and talk about how it is we got to where we're at um pierce disease was really first discovered in texas about 1949 in, in uh, winter haven florida or excuse me winter haven texas down in in the uh the winter garden uh but it was the the great feasibility study written by uh, ron perry in 1974 that really took a bunch of anecdotal information about where Pierce disease was and where it wasn't. And, and it, Ron uh, labeled Pierce disease as the number one limiting factor to growing grapes in Texas. And as we'll find out, it, 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 it indeed is, and it's all over the state. But at that time, in 1974, Ron created this map of relative probability of the disease. And just uh, among people that were working with a and at the time, we basically said, Anywhere south of I-10 or anywhere east of Interstate 35 was at risk of Pierce disease. But other than that, we really didn't know it to exist. But again, Ron was probably a little more correct with his uh, predictive map about uh, where it might or might not be. I've been watching vines die from Pierce disease for a long time. Uh, when I worked in, I worked in a peace breeding and variety development program. I worked with a lot of other crops at a and in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And we indeed evaluated grape selections from a number of different breeding programs from Florida, from Arkansas, uh, different areas. And uh, one of the things, just the inherent nature of the Brazos River bottom, extremely high Pierce disease pressure. So uh, we got a good chance to see what died and how quickly things died uh, over a period of time. The two maps on the left, uh, the upper one is a colorized version of bronze map I created. But I wanted to point out how strongly uh, that this risk is associated with chilling. At the time, we really didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if, if it was a limitation of the range of the insects or what. But we now know that, that Xylella fastidiosa, uh, the causal organism of Pierce disease, is indeed sensitive to cool, cool and cold temperatures. And it's an indirect effect. It's not a direct effect. If you take infected cuttings uh, with uh, grape cuttings with Pierce disease and you put them through low temperatures, nothing happens. But if you take infected grape plants, rooted plants that are infected and take them through cold temperatures, the cold temperatures can indeed be therapeutic. We believe the cold temperatures are triggering the production of cold shock proteins in vines that go up and seek out and destroy the bacteria. And so in the, in the hill country here, when we have cold winters, long winters, we think that it was curing a lot of the, uh, the uh, infections that were taking place. And certainly up on the high plains, uh, you know, where the winters are long and in West Texas, we thought that the cold temperatures would absolutely exclude the bacterium from surviving in grapevines there. I came back to, to Texas in 1996 after eight years at Cornell and uh, it, it, the, things proverbially hit the fan uh, and there was Pierce's disease everywhere. Uh, the top picture is Grape Creek Vineyard uh, planted by Ned Sims, 100% uh, death in the Chardonnay block was, you know, and over a period of about 18 months, we came to realize that Pierce disease was in every vineyard in the hill country, and the future of the wine industry here at, at the, is, was, was in jeopardy. At that time, there were seven wineries in the hill country, very small, but very vocal and, and uh, vehement group that something needed to be done. So we, you know, all of the information at that time was, was coming out of California, and what we were finding is that the recommendations out of California weren't working. Things weren't the way they described it there. So obviously we knew that 
Things were different and we needed to find the answers for ourselves. So in 2005, we actually achieved the first federal funding for Pierce's disease in Texas. And you know, there were a number of things we needed to find out. First of all, where is Pierce's disease in Texas? I mean, we really didn't have any you know, definitive limitations. Uh, we started to realize that in around 2000, Pierce's disease was confirmed at Blue Mountain Vineyard at Fort Davis. And that just blew our minds because Fort Davis is at 5,000 feet. We figured Pierce's disease could never survive there. Winters are long, winters are cold, but indeed Blue Mountain Vineyard died. Uh, and Pierce's disease was one of the contributing factors to that death. And over the period, over a period of time, uh, J.C. Lewis, uh, who works at the lab here now, uh, did, did the first statewide vineyard mapping and surveys of the state. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, in about uh, 2000 and five or 2006 she came to me uh at grape camp and she goes well you know the, the symptoms you're showing me here in the hill country i'm seeing them all over the high plains and we just said well that's that's preposterous you know we think the pierce disease can't survive in the high plains and she said i'm telling you that's what i'm seeing so over a period of time she went back and collected samples and lo and behold everything she thought was hot was indeed hot we'll talk a little bit more about the high plains here in a second but certainly the, the range of pierce disease in texas was expanding and that wasn't just happening statewide, it was also happening across the country, uh, that we were seeing Pierce disease occur in Arkansas, in Missouri, in Virginia, uh, Delaware, it's been confirmed as far north as New Jersey. Um, and so, you know, what we were thinking is something's going on here, either the pathogen is becoming more cold hardy, or um, you know, the, the climate is changing, or both. But as Don Hopkins, who's been who's, who has worked on Pierce disease since 1968 at the University of Florida, Don would look at this map and go, <clears throat> "Well, the, the 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 range of Pierce disease is directly proportional to the number of people looking for it." So as people became more and more aware of this disease, they started looking for it, doing diagnostic testing, and lo and behold, it it is an uh, an expanded range. So another one of the things we did is okay. So when what triggered our, the federal funding was about 1999, uh, glassy wing sharpshooter was introduced into California. Glassy wings are very, very different beast than the kinds of insect vectors they'd had there before. And that, that constituted the fourth insect vector that California knew of, uh, and it was actually behaving very differently. So the question again became, well, what are the vectors here in Texas? So we had a, in conjunction with uh, USDA APHIS, had a very, uh, thorough insect testing program uh, across the state well, with an emphasis in the hill country. We tested 23 vineyards in the hill country, trapping uh, on a weekly basis or bi-weekly during the off season. But we got a relatively good idea of the, the, the insect vectors, uh, the number, the seasonality. So we started gaining some more information about things that, uh, again, is very different than it was in, in California. One of the things we found out that in addition to this guy here in the center, glassy wing sharpshooter, uh, we found the uh, on the upper left on Comatopia orbana is, is is the most problematic vector in the rest of the southeastern United States. All of the Quarium species, Paraclyces, Graphocephala, all of these are very very virulent insect vectors. And we found that we actually had over 30, I think 33 was the last number we came up with, the number of insect vectors that occur. Different parts of the state, different seasonalities. So in some parts, you know, Quirina is very important. In other parts, uh, glass wing sharpshooter is important. Oncomatopia is present in East Texas. So uh, again, we got a, a big idea of what we were up against. And uh, the Proconii, things like Quirina and Oncomatopia and glass wing sharpshooter, this explained what what was different about California. California was describing a very strong edge effect where you'd really only see Pierce disease come in two, three, maybe four rows out of a wooded edge. And the reason for that is when they made those descriptions, they were not, they did not have glassy wing sharpshooter. So when glassy wing gets into the picture, they're a much more distant flyer, they're a much more virulent flyer, they'll feed on woody tissue, so that those infections remain present after winter pruning. And so it's, it's a, it becomes a polycyclic disease, and, and the, the dynamics of Pierce disease uh, change radically. And on the High Plains, again, JCI and uh, another uh, scientist put together a research project to try and understand what is going on in the High Plains. Uh, in the lower part of the slide, you can see summary of 
survey of diagnostic results. So we, we surveyed 13 different uh, vineyards in the High Plains, and every single one of them came up with a positive from for Pierce's disease, either an ELISA positive or, uh, or a PCR positive, which is much more sensitive. But look in the far right-hand uh, column, you'll see number of isolations, zero. We could never isolate the pathogen from these vines. And that's probably because we think now that Pierce's disease is, is much more of a chronic disease in the High Plains. We've seen vines that have been uh, uh, positively identified as having xylella in them die, but we think that the cold temperatures are indeed commonly therapeutic, uh, and so it's going to be a chronic disease and not so much an acute disease. Uh, the uh, glassy wing sharpshooter is indeed present there, but uh, the most important a uh, guild of vectors is a group of Quarantus species, some of which had never been identified before, and they fly at very different heights. Uh, but you know the, the, the bacterium is present, the vectors are present, the disease is present, but it's it's really more muted by the cold temperatures that occur. Now in West Texas, we have flat seen vineyards die. I don't know really what the difference is, uh, and you know the pathologist taught me something that you know if, if you know my Rudimentary understanding is that if an insect carrying the bacterium feeds on a vine, it's infected. It becomes infected. Well, after we've been doing some field uh, inoculations, we find that that's not necessarily the case. You know, in, 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 in an infection event may or may not take the bacterium, may or may not start growing in that plant tissue. So in areas with very high pressure where they're being fed on by hot sharpshooters 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times a day, yeah, you're going to get infected. But when the feeding incidence is much lower and or the infection rate of these vectors is lower, you know, the infection, sometimes they take, sometimes they don't. If they happen late in the season, could be the cold temperatures not come back. So that was kind of our, our introductory understanding of PD in the high plains. Now, obviously, a lot of more work needs to be done, but there, at, at this point, there's, there's no funding to support that work. Likewise, Dave Apple, plant pathologist at College Station, this, this work was actually done before we had federal funding. There were a group of us who were just working together on, you know, nickels and dimes, trying to get some, a basic understanding of it. And from 2003 to 2005, Dave Apple scored individual vines in this one block of Viognier in the Hill Country uh, Viognier Vineyard. And you, so the, the, uh, uh, the scale is pretty obvious there. Green is healthy. Uh, uh, yellow is insipid, uh, red is advanced, four is dead. So you can see going from year one to year two, the infection rate just absolutely jumps. And by the time you're in year three, the number of healthy vines in this block is, is you know, less than 5%. So in, 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 in varieties like Viognier that are very, very susceptible, this disease can spread like wildfire uh, through the vineyard. And that's what we were seeing in the hill country. Things were dying, people were flipping out. We also, some of the first funded work, we also, uh, we had noticed, I had noticed that there was uh, Fall Creek Vineyard in Taub, Texas, was, was one of the two oldest vineyards in the Hill Country. And it had been completely wiped out by Pierce disease more than one time. So as our understanding grows, we realize that the more Pierce disease, uh, vines get infected with Pierce disease, we don't really know what the plants are in the environment, but the environment appears to get loaded up with this bacterium where it's living benignly in a lot of the native plants. So Fall Creek was the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, perfect laboratory. We, we knew we had very high pressure. At, at Fall Creek, there was one single vine that was growing up against the shop. And I went and asked the manager at the time, I said, well, what is that? He goes, oh, that's just an old SO4 rootstock vine that uh, the top broke out of it. We planted it there as an ornamental. So even though susceptible varieties had absolutely been creamed, this one SO4 vine was still alive there, and it really starts to make sense. When you think about, you know, the native species in this part of Texas, Vitus berlandieri comes to mind, and that is really it was the, the native parent that was used to help overcome phylloxera that is, is, is common in many of our modern rootstocks. So we put out an ungrafted rootstock trial, rootstocks with no scion on top from a number of different lineages, and we waited to see how they responded, and they responded very quickly. Again, it's... it's absolutely blazing hot with PD at the site. So you can see things with, that had no Berlandieri uh, parentage like harmony and freedom, uh, the, the pruning weight, and this is, so this is relative figure, the pruning weight was virtually non-existent. The things just got hammered. 16, 16, 16, thir uh, 13, again, these are uh, riparia by rupestris crosses. 
know they'll come from par parentage in them. I got hit pretty hard. 5BB uh, is part, it is uh, uh, Berlandieri, uh, has one of his parents, as is SO4, 1103 Paulson. So what we're seeing there is these vines are, are surviving. And when we get to things like Richter 110 that is very vigorous, Salt Creek, Dog Ridge, Champanel, those things were all holding their, their weight pretty well. And likewise, when we take a look at the, at the, uh, at the, the health uh, or Pierce disease symptoms in these root stocks, you kind of see the, uh, the flip side of that. Freedom and Harmony are, are dead by year two. 1616, uh, 1613, 16, half, you know, half of them or so are dead. 5BB, uh, we had 20% mortality. And again, as we started getting into 5C, 110R, Salt Creek, Dog Ridge, Champanel, these things were holding up very, very well and not showing a lot of the symptoms associated with PD. Okay, so this leads us to the one single piece uh, of, of management that uh, is probably most responsible for uh, us, the revival of the Hill Country grape industry, and that's the use of uh, imidacloprid, uh, a systemic neonicotinoid insecticide, very low mammalian toxicity, uh, when injected into the vines, uh, when injected through the irrigation to the vines, uh, the vines pick it up, imidacloprid uh, becomes uh, systemic in the plant, and the the, uh, the protocol that's been developed is uh, starting around the 15th of, or around the, uh, yeah, the 1st of April, uh, use half, half a rate around the 1st of May, use the other half a rate, and then by doing this split application, you can maintain a 50, at least a 15 part per billion level of imidacloprid in the vines. And it acts primarily as a feeding deterrent if sharpshooters feed on it. And again, it works across the whole guild of vectors. Sharpshooters feed on it, they become disoriented, they quit feeding, and they die. Okay, but the feeding has happened. So it's, you know, it's, it's not bulletproof by any means, uh, but it is the single most important uh, component of. Uh, uh, the management plan. The others are site selection, staying away from riparian areas, uh, excellent um, uh, uh, weed control in the vineyard, around the vineyard, roguing of infected vines is extremely important, and Dave Apple demonstrated this. Again, you saw how quickly it spread through that DNA block, so when you see an infected vine, you need to pull it because it serves as a source of inoculum for, uh, for, for adjacent vines. So uh, there are a couple of other things that, that we add into it, and we can talk about that later. <clears throat> but, you know, so we're kind of dependent on nicotinoids at this point. Okay, so um, putting Jim, all this together. Jim, we yes. have a question. Somebody's asking, Andrew is asking about zinc treatment. I, um, are you able to see the questions? No, I, I'm, I'm not. I've got, let me see, my volume box okay. maybe. Blocking that. Okay. Yeah, Pierre DeWitt, uh, the late Pierre DeWitt uh, over in Tyler, Texas, was using zinc treatments. I mean, we followed this. Uh, uh, Bruce, uh, oh, what was Bruce's last name? Plant Pathologist, University of California at Davis, uh, thoroughly explored zinc, thoroughly explored copper, all of the other heavy metals, and he concluded it didn't work. Now, Pierre claimed it worked, but he also would look at us with kind of a wink and a nod. He was a strong believer in zinc for lots of reasons, but the fact of the matter is, uh, it is, you know, while it may have some therapeutic value, it's not going to control Pierce's disease. It's, uh, it's, you know, we've, we just, we've seen it tried too many times and seen it fail. There were, in, in, let me put it this way, in vineyards that were treated with zinc to control Pierce disease, there were still commonly 20 to 30% of vines replaced on an annual basis. So that's how much it works. Okay, so what what concerns me is if you take uh, a, a survey of Hill Country grape growers right now and ask them, you know, what's their leading problem, I don't think anybody will say Pearson's disease. And that's because we've known this disease has always been very cyclic. And now we think we start to understand why. We had cold events in 2010 and 2011, very cold winters, which were most probably curative to a lot of infections. The drought of 2010 and 2000 was devastating to sharpshooter populations. I mean, it was a, it was the greatest drought in recorded history, and our, the insect, the sticky cards, were coming back with no bugs on them. That's because the the drought took care of the insects for us. 
you're never going to completely decimate a population of insects. You're going to reduce it greatly. But then uh, another thing that's problematic is, uh, well, I, I say in here we are in danger of losing a metacloper because of beehive colony collapse. This, is, this product has been implicated as a factor of beehive colony collapse. But the argument that's being made by Bayer, who's, who was the base producer, and some of the other uh, producers now, uh, is that you know if, when you're using it on, on bee-pollinated crops, it's indeed problematic. But if you have a wind-pollinated crop like grapevines, you know, it's, it's not really problematic. Now, that said, we need to be good stewards uh, of, of our vineyards and of these products. Um, and uh, if you have, if you're using it in a vineyard, you have to have like something like clovers as a ground cover below, uh, below the vines and metacloper is getting into the clover. Yes, that will be introduced through clover pollen to the bee, bee colony. So just, you need to be mindful of that um, when you're trying, trying to manage PD. And the biggest problem is in the last few years, we've had mild winters. This past season was the warmest year in the hill country since 1906. And we've had wet growing seasons for the last three or four years. And what we've seen is the numbers of sharpshooters has gone back up to the levels we were seeing 2004, 2005. And consequently, the number of Pierce's disease strikes we're seeing in vineyards, a lot of the growers don't see them. I mean, it, there's a lot... It concerns me that a lot of the people growing grapes now didn't go through this this disaster we went through 15, 20 years ago, and so there's no collective memory of it. So what we're seeing is there's more Pierce disease coming, and this is indeed going to be a big problem. So what my, my point here is, and again, this is all kind of preface to what we are here to talk about. We're still in need of a long-term sustainable solution to Pierce disease. Before we get into exactly what we, we have done, I want to talk about plant response to, to Pierce disease. The first one is susceptibility, the lack of any resistance mechanism. Things like Labruscas, like Concord and Niagara, all of the vinifera varieties, French American hybrids, they're all susceptible. They have great differences in field longevity. For example, um, in the uh, French American hybrids, uh, something like uh, Foch is very, very sensitive. Once it gets it, it'll show symptoms very quickly and die very quickly. Other uh, hybrids like Chambersin are very slow to show symptoms and will live sometimes seven, eight years showing the symptoms and still be able to produce at least some. The problem with Chambersin is it tends to overcrop itself. And so Pierce disease coupled with overcropping, the vines will indeed die. Same thing tr is true though with, with Vinifera. Chardonnay, DNA are very susceptible. They will commonly show you symptoms the year they are infected. Other varieties like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon have, have field longevity. That means they'll, they'll be infected and the disease will spread within the vine. It takes them a couple of years to start showing symptoms. And typically they will live for three or four, five years, even with the disease, still be somewhat productive, but the vines will ultimately decline and ultimately die. Okay, so the second plant response is resistance. And that's the ability of the host to limit colonization of the, by the pathogen. And we don't really understand it. It's probably biochemical in nature, but, but native species like virus Arizonica and smallii have the ability to keep the titer, keep the bacterial colony of the, of the pathogen down low. And by low, we're saying 10 to the third or below, which is really below the point that will show uh, symptoms in vines. The third response is tolerance. And that's what we're seeing in all of our native species. It's not that the vines don't get infected. They do indeed have high titers of the bacterium. We think that there's something in the xylem architecture that keeps the vines from being seriously affected. So things like black Spanish, Blanc de Bois, Miss Blanc, and all again, all of our native species are tolerant, which also makes them problematic because that makes them very potent carriers. If you have something like Blanc de Bois, you must assume that it is carrying, even from the nursery, you need to assume that it is carrying the disease. So if you have a Blanc de Bois vineyard, you plant a Blanc vineyard, and you plant a Chardonnay vineyard next to it, well, you're introducing the pathogen right next door to a very susceptible host. So keep that in mind. Now, we do know people that grow both, but they commonly will, will, will separate these vineyards, uh, isolate them by at least a quarter of a mile. And this brings us to an, an, another point. It's, it's really pretty interesting. When we used to think of uh, Norton or Cynthiana as being a uh, resistive variety or a tolerant variety, it's really not. 
but but there is a huge range of of uh, response to it. So the uh, the graph there is in uh, the amount of xylella uh, in in both Blanc de Bois and Black Spanish in Cynthiana. And this is Le uh, Lisa Morano's work from University of Houston. She she hasn't been working with our group for quite some time, but she's a very talented researcher and a good resource. So what she did is she monitored the back the tighter the bacteria of these city varieties over time, and she would see that black Spanish and Blanc de Bois, the tighter would get relatively high, 10 to the fourth or so in the summertime, and then uh, it would plateau. And then the next year, when the vines came out of, of dormancy, the tighter would be low. So they have some kind of natural mechanism to keep the tighter the bacteria low. Not so with, with Norton or Cynthiana, because the tighter the bacteria keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And what's interesting is Norton will respond very differently in different climates. When you take Norton and you put it in the Gulf Coast, it, it does indeed decline over time. It will, you know, productivity goes down, it will ultimately die. Sometimes sprouts will come from the ground. But but there's a planting of Norton over on Lake Travis where it gets challenged many fewer times than you would in the Gulf Coast region. And those vines are fine. They'll occasionally show a little scorch. But they tend, they appear to not be challenged enough to where they're they're still very productive. So it's it's pretty interesting to see that difference just in location. Okay, so then let's talk about what what else that has been going on in, in the grape world in terms of uh, using genetics to try and overcome uh, Pierce disease. And, and occasionally you'll still see news flashes out of California. There are five labs in California: Lincoln Lab, Lavovich, Dandekar. Bruce Kirkpatrick, he's passed away now, and Steve Lindau at, at, uh, at Berkeley, they've all developed independent modes of action using, using uh, genetically modified systems to inhibit xylella growth. Now, these guys are brilliant biochemists, but frankly, they're not very good grape growers. So while these, these transitions work in the laboratory, they may work in the, in, the, in the greenhouse, when you move them out into a hot environment in, 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 the, in vineyard settings, they tend to fall apart, and they're typically working with Thompson seedless as a as a proof of concept. And they've never gotten past that past past that stage. So the transgenic guys are still working at it, but it's it's. And I worked sat on the scientific advisory committee that over you know that that evaluated these things, and I pretty much know them in and out. And there there's nothing that that has worked, and they're years away from getting anything to work. Now that is said, the California Wine Grape Growers Association has come out publicly, and this was. 10, 12 years ago, saying they will not accept a genetically modified grape as a solution to Pierce's disease. Because, I mean, people, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, most of the field crops like corn, they're all genetically modified. Many of them are Roundup tolerant. But, you know, so people don't care what the variety of corn that goes in the tortilla chip is, but people certainly do care about what the variety of grape is that goes into their wine. And they, it's, it's not so much science, but it's perception that, you know, the grape growing community is saying transgenic solutions to Pierce disease are simply socially unacceptable. So that leads us to conventional breeding and our affiliation with Andy Walker, who's the great breeder, uh, sign breeder and root stock breeder at UC Davis. Uh, we develop a strong working relationship with Andy and uh, he's been very, very generous uh, with his work and his, and his time for us. So, Andy and there are others that we'll talk about are using resistant or tolerant parents to back cross vinifera to produce, produce new uh, selections uh, via traditional breeding methods. So, so currently, what are our, our, our options for Pierce disease in the hot zone? Uh, what is, uh, that's a, again, that's a Lisa Morano term that where it's just blazing hot in, in, the, uh, in the old probability map where it's red. And... Uh, the first one is, is Herbamont. Herbamont's been grown uh, commercially in, in Texas and Mexico since 1830. They have, the wine oxidase, oxidizes pretty readily. It turns out that they call it the brown wine. Uh, you know, it's, if, if there's nothing else available, I guess people drink it. Um, the one on the far right, Black Spanish, I think people are probably pretty familiar with it. A lot of people in the Gulf Coast are using it to make port, and it makes a good port wine. But frankly, it does not make a very good still wine. It's certainly not on a repeated basis. The one in the center that is, is quite different though. John Mortensen's 1988 release, Blanc de Bois, we didn't really know how to handle it in the winery, in the vineyard and in the winery. It blacks, I mean, Blanc de Bois makes, can make beautiful, beautiful wines. Uh, it needs to be, you need to not wait until the, the, 
you know, the soluble solids get into 22, 23 range. It needs to be picked at 19, 20, 21 tops. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's resistant to powdery mildew. Uh, and it needs to be cold fermented in the winery. But people, winemakers have learned how to make good Blanc de Bois. So we do have one good white option. But uh, that, that's simply not enough. A lot of our wineries are located in, in high population centers, Dallas, Houston, near Austin and San Antonio. All of those growing regions tend to have a moderate to very high Pierce disease pressure. Okay, so when we started talking about evaluating uh, varieties that were resistant or tolerant to Pierce disease, you know, we went, we had to go back to the, to the earlier days and look at some of the work of, of uh, uh, T.D. Munson. Thomas Foley Munson uh, was a grape explorer. He thought Texas was heaven because of the diversity of grape species. And he developed over 300 different varieties. And so we went back to his, his text, his 1900 text, 1909 text, Foundation of American Grape Culture, and started going through there and looking at some of the parentage of some of the crosses he made and some of the varieties he released. Again, at least over 300 varieties, we weren't going to find them all. And certainly, finding wood, verified wood, uh, uh, you know, correctly identified for these varieties became problematic because uh, at the Munson Center, uh, some of the things were mislabeled. A lot of these have been lost uh, over the years. But we were able to pick up 13 or 14 of Munson's varieties and, and put them into our trial. Again, certainly, um, you know, Andy Walker stuff was where we wanted to go. Uh, Lisa Morano uh, was an old friend of, of uh, Andy Walker, uh, basically introduced us. And I also have pictures of, of Lisa twisting Andy's arm uh, to come to Texas and work with us and, and let us look at some of his, uh, his selections that were uh, much higher quality uh, that uh, were resistant to Pierce's disease. Now, a lot of Andy's work uh, is dependent on some of the work that was done before by uh, Harold Olmo. Olmo was an avid grape collector and uh, spent a lot of time exploring the desert southwest uh, through from Big Bend all the way through northern mountains of Mexico uh, across almost uh, to, to Campeche. Um, and he had a number of different accessions of Vitus Arizonica that he found to be resistant to Pearson's disease. Now, the biggest problem in, in breeding Pierce disease resistance, things like Mortensen encountered when he was breeding Blanc de Bois, the disease is multigenic. It means it takes a long time, you know, or it takes, when you breed, you get a lot of segregation with every seedling population. And so there's no way to continue to, doing back crosses because you lose the, the resistance. What Andy found is that all of the genes for resistance to Pierce disease in, in Vitus Arizonica occurred on a single locus, a single spot on a chromosome. And so by using marker-assisted selection, he could basically screen the seedling population to find out what carried this gene and what didn't. And so he only grew out things that were resistant. And so he had a very high success rate. And what he did is continue doing back crosses to Vitus uh, vinifera selections to where he, he first had 50% uh, uh, vinifera, then 75% vinifera, and then 88% vinifera, 94 and now 97% vinifera, all that have at least one line of resistance to Pierce's disease. We also tested the, the, uh, a lot of the selections from um, another institution, Florida A&M University is an 1890 institution uh, in uh, Northern Florida. And the, the guy that was the great breeder is named uh, Zhang Lu. Uh, Zhang inherited this uh, breeding program and, you know, it. Frankly, it was a pretty disorganized effort. There were some, some uh, seedlings there that were, or selections that were reported to be resistant to Pierce's disease, but that's all we really knew. And Jane sent us, I think, 10 initially. He sent us a bunch of others. And, and when we started screening this material, it was, it was wild. Some of this stuff basically made grapes at all, or there'd be two or three berries on a cluster. Some of it was, was just gorilla. It's just monster vines. Uh, but, you know, as we look, we're, we're, work through this material, there were some indeed that, that uh, you know, were, were reasonable. Some of the things that, that uh, came out of the Arkansas program that were not bred specifically for Pierce disease resistance, but used native species for powdery mildew resistance, ended up coming, with, coming up with, out of Arkansas, things like Arkansas 1475. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about that in the past, uh, in, in the next couple of slides. From Mississippi, the USDA... Uh, uh, breeding station, uh, Poplarville, Mississippi, Miss Blanc and Miss Blue uh, were 
were released and hadn't really been uh, uh, formally evaluated. There was another variety from Mortensen's breeding program that, that some collectors in Houston had. They called it Mortensen Hardy. It was a private breeder here in Fredericksburg, Ronnie Zimmerman, who I think he passed away at 99. Uh, he had Etzel, which is a, a cross of two uh, Munson varieties, Edna and Salamander. And then we also found in the literature reports that some there were some German uh, varieties that were reported to be resistant or tolerant to Pierce disease, Phoenix, Orion, and Sirius. And when we take a look at them, they all had VR Blanc or VR 12-375 in their parentage, which is also known to be have some resistance to Pierce's disease. So uh, we had uh, those to look at. We established them in, in a couple of different locations. One in the Gulf Coast in Austin County, Texas, my, my family's uh, home uh, stomping grounds near Industry, Texas, and Doug Rowlett's Vineyard. Doug has, over the years, has been very generous with his space and his resources and his cooperation to help us get these uh, plots in the ground. And another one, and again, another fantastic cooperator in Lakey, Texas, uh, Frio Canyon Vineyard. So we had very different locations. Both had very high Pierce disease pressure, but we were able to look at them under different climatic uh, situations. So what, did, what were we looking at? We were looking at uh, Pierce disease tolerance, of course. Wanted to make sure that the things held up under very high pressure of Austin County. We were looking at their vigor. Did these vines grow? I mean, were they puny? Were and everything we some of these things were planted on their own roots, but we tried to have everything uh, grafted on 5BB as well. We Want to take a look at the phenology? When do they break dormancy? You know, what are the flowering dates, foraging dates? When do they ripen? You know, and just some of the minimal yield, fruit quality, fruit chemistry uh, observations. One of the most important things is we needed to find out. Again, these things are uh, especially Andy Walkers were coming out of California where they don't really have a problem with downy, don't have black rot, don't you know. The, the fungal pathogens are, are much fewer there than here. So we need to figure out if they're going to hold up under under our disease pressure as well. This is a picture of a uh, variety trial in Austin County. It's, you can see how green it is there, relatively high rainfall area. Uh, I tried to grow peaches in it for a while. It was brown rot heaven. Uh, it is so disease pressure is can be absolutely uh, mind blowing. Here's some of the initial data we collected in 2012. Uh, you can take a look at the harvest dates. We're looking anywhere from the end of June through the end of July. Uh, what our bricks readings were, pH, berry weights. When you take a look at, at some things like Phoenix and Orion, you'll see we have bricks readings and pH readings, but when you see no berry weight, that's because uh, they, they tended to crack under high rainfall conditions near ripening. Um, and then I think the next slide will show you that. This is something we continually ran into in the Gulf Coast region. And frankly, this is what the growers in that region are going to be up against. You know, we had a relatively dry spring, then all of a sudden, uh, in the middle of July, we get three and a half inches of rain. You know, everything, the, the berries are small. And so all this rainfall, the berries start cracking, they start rotting. And so, you know, avoiding tropical storms and, and, and high rainfall conditions are going to be problematic. Uh, so that's, that's just the nature of that beast. Uh, we didn't have the same problems in Lakey, uh, but you know we needed to see how these how these things do indeed hold up. This uh, and, okay, so here's kind of a shakeout of, of some of the red varieties uh, by bricks U0502-38 uh, and U0505-35. Uh, this is at Austin County, 2321 bricks. We'd like to see certainly the, the, the soluble content, soluble solids content higher than than 21. But again, uh, under high rainfall conditions, we were doing relatively well. pHs are still up there. Again, that's going to be something uh, we're going to have to fight with. 26, Carmen, 10, uh, U0502-10. These are Florida selections, Lomanto, Delicatessen, Ben-Hur, so on and so forth. And this is kind of where we, you know, when you, when you do evaluations like this, you can't, you can't fall in love with all of your children. Some of them have to go. And so, you know, the idea is some of this stuff, Things like Bailey and, and Miss Bailey tastes like cotton candy. Nobody wants wine that tastes like cotton candy. Same with delicatessen. It tastes like grape popsicle. So you know, these are not flavors that are that are conducive to uh, what people perceive as high quality wine. So, as again, some of the Florida, Florida selections were just, you know, you had to shake your head. Why did people keep these things? Because they, they either didn't yield or, you know, they were just, they were nuts. They were, they were almost wild types. 
So we did some pretty quick sorting out. And the reason for that is because Andy Walker was saying, hey, I've got more stuff to send your way. Uh, and we wanted to make sure we had room for it. Some of the ones that, that did survive the initial cut were things like Carmen, uh, which is a cross between Premier and, and Triumph, which is a conquered by Muscat of Alexandria cross, an old variety. Lamonto, actually, when we did some of our tastes, I'll describe some of the uh, evaluations we've done with wine, winemaker test panels. Lamonto shook out pretty well. People liked Lamonto. Uh, it's, it's very disease resistant. Uh, doesn't crack, loose cluster architecture, doesn't rot. Um, and, and some of my nursery friends out of the, uh, the Northeastern United States say they have a lot of demand for Lamonto. So out of the old classic varieties, this is probably the one that has, has uh, the, the most potential. In terms of Andy Walker selections, we, again, we started taking a look at these uh, and you know, we knew we couldn't, couldn't keep them all. We wanted to find the best of them. Here's a uh, UO502-10. 505-35, which frankly is, is my favorite out of the whole lot of Andy's 88% uh, Vinifera. Uh, UO502-20 is a white grape, makes beautiful. Uh, a lot of the guys that have been following Andy's work call this Andy Walker Chardonnay, because it does indeed have, have Chardonnay uh, like flavors, and Chardonnay is, is one of the parents in that uh, third back cross to Vinifera. Uh, nice wine, uh, it's certainly commercially acceptable. Uh, but the problem is it's really downy sensitive. I mean, even in the hill country, we get into the last two or three wet years, downy wants to eat us up. Uh, and, and in the hill country, or excuse me, in, in, in the Gulf Coast, guys that are used to growing black Spanish and Blanc de Bois get caught sleeping by this because it's much more downy sensitive. And, you know, the spray programs can't be the same. They simply can't survive on the same scale. Here's the one selection out of Florida we actually like, A24-6-6. And again, Parentage is unknown. Jane Lee didn't know what the heck this stuff was, but we like A24 because it's, it's tough as nails. It tends to be more procumbent, like Blanc de Bois wants to grow down. Uh, but since it's a red, you're not really worried about it coloring. It's very, very disease resistant. It has good neutral flavors. I mean, neutral is non-offensive. It doesn't taste like nothing. It's, it's a good, it would be a good blender. So we think, we think it, it, it has some potential. And, and actually, there are some, some larger plots of that out in the Gulf Coast. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, Justin has worked with this in the, in the winery or in, in wine, with my winemaking in the past. Uh, there are indeed two table grapes out of the, out of the University of Arkansas program. Uh, Arkansas 1475 was released in 2010, and it's a seeded, large, buried, large cluster variety. Variety clusters weigh over a pound, varies way over six grams. It typically has two seeds. Uh, a lot of people are growing this and selling them in farmers markets in Austin, uh, San Antonio, and they're they're getting three dollars a pound. So while these aren't wine wine grapes, uh, they they do have a place and they are tolerant of Pierce disease. They carry a high titer. Uh, Arkansas 1475 is a is a uh, it's not even out of the same cross, but came out of the same program. This was Jim Moore's crosses that uh, John Clark is now managing. Arkansas 1400 is seedless, and and both of these grapes do what the do what we're showing you here with no cluster manipulation. Typically, uh, table grapes are either they're girdled, they're they're cluster thin, uh, they're they're sprayed with gibberellic acid both before bloom and after bloom. These have none of those inputs, so these are just blow as you go, uh, uh, PD tolerant table grapes. Arkansas 1400. We tried to propagate it on rootstocks, and it turns out it had every virus known to grape kind. It is going through the uh, 1020 protocol and it is due to be released. The wood is due to be released to nurseries this coming spring. So we hope to have Arkansas 1400 to growers uh, relatively soon. The PD variety trial at Lakey gave us, uh, you know, good quality fruit. Unfortunately, one of the problems there is that we could we could net bird net it and keep the birds out of it, but the keeping the electric fence hot to keep the raccoons out of it to be problematic and we got relatively limited data out of the Lakey trial. We've consequently put plots in it high and again we're, we're starting to put these uh, wines through uh, a panel of winemakers to let them evaluate them and see what they like what they don't like. Are these commercially acceptable? Would you make wine out of these in larger scales? And this is kind of an overview of the Andy Walker selections that, that we've looked at. You know UO 502 that's 20 is the beautiful white but it's very downy susceptible. 502-38, excellent color, excellent tannin structure. Uh, it's an absolute keeper. 
35 is a keeper. 10 had modest quality and yield marginal quality. Two, uh, 26 had, everybody felt that the painted structure was, was uh, and the color was a little off and it wasn't going to be acceptable. 501-12 and 501-1 are both dogs. Uh, so we, we can them pretty quickly. And again, as we start to take a look at 2013, we're getting acceptable, you know, soluble solids contents coming out of, we've got them at Lakey High and in industry. Again, the Gulf Coast is going to be problematic in lower bricks simply because of rainfall and, and nighttime temperatures. So these things are probably going to have to be picked on pH, and there may be need to be some chaptalization done in, in the Gulf Coast. As we go to 2014, again, uh, you see that our BRICS levels are, are acceptable in most locations. pHs, again, are, can be problematic. And again, I think uh, that needs to be the main criteria winemakers using when picking these things. But the data continues to be strong over years of, of evaluation. Oh, we all still started fruity. Uh, so we had tested seven of Andy Walker's 88% vinifera, and then he sent us wood of four of his 90%, 94% selections. 75, uh, and I said it's excellent, of course. This is one of the five great varieties that Andy Walker has released. Uh, another one, we, the two I really like for whites, uh, we call 51 and 84. Very, very different wines, but beautiful, beautiful wines. Uh, and we have a pretty good spray program here. We have not seen uh, excessive, um, you know, downy mildew susceptibility or anything. Uh, the 131 for us, it, it simply doesn't set fruit. So there's there's going to be a dog in every group. In 2014, uh, harvest, and again, it's intended to take a look at color intensity. Uh, now, all of these 88% vinifers here, if you put some of the wine on a piece of white paper, well, you will start to see a little bluing, which is characteristic of, of French hybrid varieties and people don't like. But, you know, in terms of the, the taste of the wine, the quality of the wines, I mean, the color in the bottle is fine. The color in the, in the glass is fine. And the quality of the wines is, is, is really pretty good. And when we made these wines, we haven't gone out to make the best wine we could, stylistically the best wine. It wasn't our goal. We were trying to cookie cutter these wines, make, you know, make every wine the same so we could evaluate this one versus this one. What we're, where we actually are now is taking some of these grapes to winemakers and saying, okay, do what you can with this. Give it your best shot, and let's see what these can come up come up looking like. Here's the fruit chemistry. Uh, again, uh, uh, my extension associate uh, uh, walked away from his P uh, PhD program and, and quit his job as, as uh, extension specialist in the, in the Hill Country, so that kind of left me uh, and quite shorthanded. Andrea and Justin helped me with this, but we, we actually we picked six wines, picked and made six wines this year. Uh, uh, 75, but when he's released, we picked a 22.8 bricks, pH 3.51. Andrea, would you like to make any, any comments about this when you actually took this back to College Station? And yes, with the, the, we processed the grapes, we made uh, wine, and um, it, in my opinion, it's the wine is excellent. I am also working on a, a small research project involving the parentage of, of this particular selection. <laughs> Um, the parentage includes Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Syrah, and um, I'm um, looking at comparing um, the three varietals and see how the selection does um, as it stands next to to its parents. So, but um, but the wine itself is really really good. I'm very pleased with it. Yes. Great, great. I'm I'm glad. The two whites of the 94 percent we picked it certainly uh, at target pHs for white wines, and we were. It was a good year. I mean, our, our harvest chemistries came out good. We had uh, pretty good pHs and TAs associated with these these bricks. Of the 38, uh, the excuse me, the 88 percent, actually, the uh, UO502-38 got away from me. You know, it's one of those things that uh, it went from 23 bricks to 27.5 bricks in about a week, uh, and it raised them pretty badly. pH was a little bit elevated, but the wine is like ink. Uh, it is incredible. Um, uh, 35, we picked a, a little low, and 20, again, it was the white. We, we we kept the downy off of it this year. It makes a fantastic white wine as well. <laughs> okay, so Andy Walker has announced the release of five different selections, and we only looked at one of them. And this is, I can't see the number on the page. Uh, this probably is 75. It's the one we have looked at. It is, Large, yes. very yeah. Okay, I, I can't I can't see that all on my on my screen. Uh, this is the one we see. This is the one Andre described to you. 
and and we so we know this one will perform very very well for us here. The others we haven't seen, and here's why: because Andy sent us his 88% material. He sent four of his 94% selections, and as he started talking about the progress of his breeding program around the United States, the California grape growers got pissed. Why are you sending Texas the results of you know the, the hard work that we funded of this PD you know resistant stuff? And so basically. They told Andy, stop it. And so Andy, you know, he's, he's a stand-up guy. He's going to do what he has to do. He said, sorry, you know, we can't send you anymore. So we've, 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 we've looked at, at what, we've, what he's allowed us to look at. But I talked to Andy Day before yesterday. He is going to send me wood of all of the new releases for us to start evaluations on here in Texas. Here's another one. This is Zinfandel Petit Syrah Cab Cross uh, 047. Uh, he's high on. This is a 97%. That first one, 75, it's the only 94% he's he's releasing. So 47, again, I can't see the number on this one, the Sylvaner, Karen Yan, Cross, um, Cab, Karen Yan, and Shard Cross, 102, and 016. I'm looking at a California Pierce Disease Board bulletin. I'm sure you can find it online. So it's UC Davis and a pre-release of five new Pierce Disease Resistant Wine Grape cultivars. So, when I talked to Andy, I said, well, so what's the deal? He goes, well, we, it's a conditional release. What we've done is we've released these and we've given the nurseries that want it vines. And so they're in a process. They planted vines this year. So they'll probably grow, plant them again next year. So the idea is each of these, the, the big nurseries in California want to have 1,000 vine increase blocks in order for them to grow wood. So our guess is these vines will be available for planting in the, in the 2020 planting season. 2019, perhaps, but 2020, certainly. Uh, so that's that's where we are with uh, what his releases are. And so, again, when I was talking to Andy uh, the day before yesterday, I said, so what about the orphans, Andy? What about all this stuff that I like that, uh, you know, that you're not going to release? And it's, it's a long story, but the UC patent attorneys are open to releasing a few of the 88s and maybe 94s into the public domain and the timing. Uh, basically, they want to get their the, the patent royalties coming in the door from this stuff that has been released. There'll probably be another round of 97% that are released, and then they'll think about opening these up. But I will tell you that there are other people like me in the southeastern United States, in Georgia, in the Carolinas, Virginia, who are very interested in, uh, in planting uh, test plots of these things. So I don't think they're going away uh, anytime soon. So I think that's that's all I have. I'll certainly be glad to uh, entertain any questions and, and hang out as long as people are interested. Thank you, Jim. Um, we have two questions so far. Um, okay. Can the active ingredient in Blanc de Bois be put into vinifera vines without affecting the taste and limiting piercings? Uh, no, because we don't know what that is. Again, we don't think that there's something. We, we tested for this early on. We go around to native vines and to Blanc and to Black Spanish, and we collect sap. So these, the bacteria lives in the xylem in the springtime when you have flow out of the xylem with the big flush. Uh, is there something in there? And we took, I, I did, I collected sap from all of these things and took them to Scott Sensman, who was the herbicide chemist on, on campus at the time, and he ran gas chromatography on there. And we couldn't find anything. We, in other words, we, there was nothing consistent across these things to suggest that there was a compound that limited the bacterium. We think in things like in varieties like Blanc, it's strictly the architecture of the xylem. Does the xylem itself limit movement of the bacteria? Is it large enough that it, it, it resists it re resists coagulation? We don't really know. Uh, there were a couple of people, there was one guy working on uh, the, the uh, uh, architecture of, of xylem chemistry or xylem in grapevines he, he moved on to another job, and, and that work has never been followed up on. Thank you. Um, another question was, can the sweet varieties be blended? Um, I'm not sure what varieties um, they refer to. Um, so if the, the person, Ma Michael, if you could elaborate a little bit on that question, maybe we would be able to help with an answer. And also, would it be possible to get this slideshow as a file? Sure, I'd be glad to give it to you, Andrea, and you can put it up as a, um, a PDF on your website. I'd be glad to. Absolutely, that. thank you. So and I think I... Sam had a question there. Uh, 
So, or there was another question. David, did, did David have a question? I don't see it. Maybe you see it on your end. I don't see it on my end. Sorry. Could you send that again, David? I think that was you. Let me try again. Okay. Oh, Samuel Smith. Yeah, that's David. Okay. Any predatory insects are we aware of that could be commercially raised for various PD vector managements as a management technique? And the answer is yes and no. One of the reasons, so the glassy wing sharpshooter is native here. So consequently, there are many predators, primarily uh, egg mass predators, that exist with uh, the sharpshooter. But can they be used as a management tool? Not really. They tried that in California. They found that the, the, the predators in Texas, they mass reared them, they released them in California. And yeah, you were getting some egg masses uh, with predation, but the, the, the way that those biocontrols work is you have to have the, the pest in order for biocontrol to work. So our, our idea is to get the pest level down very low. We're not going to do that with predators. And so could that be done? It's being done. It's being done in nature. That's how nature has, I mean, that is the stasis in Texas is that there are a lot of very small trichogamous wasps that that uh, infect the, infest the eggs uh, of glassy wing sharpshooter and some of these other sharpshooters can feed on them. So early in the season, the predation rate is relatively low. So as we get later and later in the season, we see the population of the natural predators build up. And so consequently, predation builds up. But again, when we, these, these don't, don't uh, overwinter that well. So in the springtime, we're starting from scratch. Question from Raymond Hack. Where does Crimson Cabernet fee fit in these trials? It doesn't. Uh, you know, Crimson, I talked to the guy that, that has Crimson Cabernet, and he absolutely has refused to put Cabernet into, or Crimson Cabernet into any of our trials. I believe it's a cross between Cabernet and Norton. And knowing what we do about Norton, I, I, there's nothing to suggest that it's actually tolerant. He wanted to sell me vines for me to evaluate. It's like, no. Um, so I, to, to my, I think, I think it's, you know, I think it's a you know, snake oil. Going back to the question that Michael asked about blending the sweet wines, the sweet wines that had a candy taste. He was referring to those wines. Oh, sure. Can they be blended? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I think it's, I think it's an off flavor that people wouldn't like, but I mean, you know, the, the beauty's in the eye of the beholder or the taster and, and do they make stable wines? Sure, you're going to have to chapelize the heck out of them because sugar content doesn't go that high. But could you blend them with some of the some of the uh, uh, higher vinifera content wines? Sure, you, absolutely, you can do it. Um, uh, I, I just, you know, that's that's going to be experimentation in the winery that, that we just really haven't done. And frankly, I think that's where we're going. Uh, uh, we work pretty closely with William Chris Winery. They're right down the road, and we actually have. Uh, all of the 88% planted at, at William Chris, and, and they're taking and they're blending some of this stuff, and they're making some very nice wines out of it. So, I mean, I, I personally think a lot of the best wines are blends anyway. So, yeah, I think that's the future of these things. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? We still have uh, two minutes or so. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, um, Professor Kamas, thank you so very much um, for um, being here today with us and doing this presentation. We um, appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm sure everybody who attended um, um, appreciates it as well. Thank you all for being with me today. And if you wouldn't mind just taking 30 seconds after this presentation completes, <clears throat> to fill out the survey that will pop up. Um, there's only a few, very few questions and um, they're helpful for me to try to figure out what your interests are and um, um, you know program these webinars to fit your interests and your needs. So I would really appreciate that. Um, thank you all again and I hope to see you uh, here next time. Yes, anything else? I want to add, add, add my thanks. Thank you for your interest. This is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. All right. Thank you. Have a good day.